Hi folks and welcome to this week's episode of the Mind, Body and Soul podcast with John Morris. This was one of those crazy shows filmed during a time when I was ill and severe lack of sleep. My guest was also on the road and travelling to his next destination, but we would not be denied from putting this show together for you, as this week I am joined for part two of our interview with legendary wrestler, actor and author and teacher, the one and the only Al Snow. We've got a lot to cover in this show, so fasten your seatbelts because it's going to be a bumpy ride. Welcome to the Mind, Body and Soul podcast with John Morris. Inspiring, motivating and educating you in finding balance in the craziness of day-to-day life. Learn from and listen to a man who has a wealth of life experience, from business to bodybuilding, artist to author, and has learned to deal with his own physical and mental wellness. But that's not all. Each week, John interviews and picks the minds of special guests from all around the world and from all walks of life. From actors to authors, wrestlers to warriors, business owners to life coaches, and so much more. Welcome to today's episode of the Mind, Body, and Soul podcast with John Morris. Okay, folks, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Mind, Body, and Soul podcast. As always, I am your host, John Morris, and welcome to the show that helps you find balance in the craziness of day-to-day life. My guest today is the man that's so nice we've had to have him on twice. He is the author of the amazing book, Self-Help Life Lessons with from the Bizarre Wrestling Career of Owl Snow. Please welcome back on the show my dear, dear friend and just wonderful person, Al Snow. Al, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, and thank you. Um, I'm sure everybody can see that I'm uh, in the midst of traveling, so <laughs> just bear with me. Um, we're about to pass an auto accident up here on the highway. So, oh, wow. Um, <laughs> Yeah, looks pretty interesting. <laughs> when we're um, doing these things live, folks, you just never know what's going to happen. You don't. You just <laughs> never do. That's the excitement of uh, doing it live. Well, I, I found a, a random thing with a guest that we had in a couple of weeks ago, a world-renowned artist, and all of a sudden she started talking about um, enjoying hallucinogenics and having a chaperone. And my face literally was just like, oh, my goodness, how do I even deal <laughs> with this? Because I wasn't expecting it at all. Um, it was just really, but hey, you know, there's yeah. an exclusive for you. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, if you wanted to, ooh, that's not good. Boy, that's that was pretty bad. Um, yeah. Hope everybody's okay. Um, yeah. Well, if you wanted an introduction to hallucinogenics, I guess that's where you got it. So. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Al, when we left off uh, last time in part one, we were talking about um, your character as as Leaf Cassidy and just about the change that you were about to go through when uh, you leave WWF at the time, now WWE, and you join ECW. Just, you know, first question, I suppose, that's on my mind. What was the difference, if any, in the locker rooms, you know, in terms of all these different personalities up there? Well, the the difference really primarily was that ECW at that point was just starting to um, develop and become a uh, you know a national player and uh, on a national stage and on in the pay per view universe. Um, so the difference in the locker rooms was that they they were more the, the locker room in ECW was a little more there was more camaraderie and a little less of the competition, um, not so cutthroat. Um, they were a lot more unified. Like if you went out, and, you know, they had a, you had a great match or something, the lo- entire locker room would be standing, waiting as you returned and would be clapping and would be like, Hey, great job, you know, and commending you Well, that never happens. Right. You know, in WWE or WWF, that does not happen because, you know, those guys are competing with you and, and yeah. they're, they're wanting, they want you to succeed because if you succeed, they succeed. But at the same time, it's very dichotomous business in the sense that they, you need to be on your own a star, but at the same time, you need everyone else to help you be a star. Correct. And and at the same time that you're trying to be a star and there you need them to help you be a star, they're also trying to be a star and need you to help them to be a star. Yeah. So it's a, it's a really, <laughs> and, and yet you all are working together, but you're all still very furiously competing yeah. at the same time. And uh, that competition hadn't quite reared itself. It was starting to, and I, I could see it. 
the fact that we were starting to do more pay-per-views and now the competition of being on TV, being that spotlight meant that you were going to be in the pay-per-view, which meant that you were going to be featured and become even a bigger star and make more money. Uh, now that the, the competition between the boys was starting to ramp up a little bit, yeah. and, you know, it was, it, it was starting to change, but it was refreshing when I first went there that, you know, there was still that very uh, unified camaraderie of, mm -hmm. of, you know, hey, we're, we're all in this together. It's us against them type of thing. And Paul Heyman was very good at, at uh, managing the talent and making not only the talent, but the audience feel like, hey, this is, this is yours. And it's, it's you, the little guy versus the two big guys. Yeah. And we're going to, you know, we're going to take them on and we're going to beat them you know, and by playing a different game. I mean, and, the, uh, it worked. Well, absolutely. And what I was going to say was, I mean, you look from where Paul Heyman began, um, you know, buying Eastern Championship Wrestling, and then obviously what would develop into Extreme Championship Wrestling. And you look where he began in his mother's basement to where eventually he ended up and where the business ended up. It, in my opinion, it was a phenomenal thing for, for the, the time that it lasted. Of course it was. I mean, it was, it was incredible, but, you know, it was the right thing at the right time and also with the right talent. He had a, access to a large pool of talent that had an immense amount of uh, experience mm -hmm. um, that had uh, no real true national exposure. Um, you know, it wasn't until they had a lot of underground exposure. There was an audience there that was aware of them through tape trading back in the day. Yeah. You know, because it wasn't the internet, so there was course, tape yeah. trading. There was, you know, the newsletters that helped get you out there and uh, and created that that interest, created that drive to see you and make you a, an attraction, a draw. But a real television on a national level. So we were brand new. We were brand new. Okay. In. So he a little bit. I think we lost you a little bit there. But 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 it's true. Yeah. You, know, you, you I'm saying, getting in a bad spot. Can you hear me? Yep, yep. I can hear you. Yeah, sorry. Still there. <laughs> but it's true, like you were saying, you know, you were something brand new, something that was fresh and it was really exciting. And talking of brand new, you know, you were at a time in your life where you were going to redevelop your character completely and reinvent yourself. Um, which is, I personally believe, one of the or the keys to success in any business that you do. And you obviously end up developing a, a very good friendship with a mannequin head. Uh, talk to us a little bit about this, because this is a really interesting story that's there. Um, and obviously how this all comes to be. He may be in a bad spot, folks, so we'll just bear with him. Can you still hear us, Al? Okay. Well, um, can you hear me? Yep, yep. I can hear check. you. Can you hear me? Oh, I can, I can sing in there. It'll come back. <laughs> we've, got, we've got a very nice still right. of, of you so looking deep and thought provoking. Yep. I can yeah. see you and then. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should put my hand. I can look off into the sun. How's that? That was a good one. That was a good one. Can you hear me now? Yep, I can hear you. Um, when I, you know, started working on trying to reinvent myself, I, I, at the time it was, it was a lot of frustration and, and, um, uh, and, uh, bad attitude, uh, okay. born out of my, you know, uh, own inexperience and, and really just not understanding where I had real true control. I, you know, 
they say that if you point the finger at somebody else, there are four, there, you know, four fingers still point back at you. And, yes. uh, you know, and, and, you know, the, really the only person you can control is you. Mm-hmm. That's it. So the more I took control of the situation and took control of myself, um, you know, the more it, it, I started to have a direction and a drive and a in success. Um, so I felt like with the character that when I was Leaf Cassidy, that anybody that was uh, for for an audience that knew me as Leaf Cassidy, I figured anybody that was that happy go lucky had to be something mentally wrong, emotionally. <laughs> and um, anybody that was you know in ECW that I had an audience of base that had followed me for years, and I assumed you know if anybody knew me that if they knew me for knew and followed my career for fourteen or fifteen years mm-hmm. that. I would reach a point of frustration that where well, maybe I would have a nervous breakdown. Yeah. And so I tried to manifest that in a couple of different ways and it, none of it really worked. None of it connected. Didn't people could figure out what I was doing. And then I, I was reading a couple of books on abnormal psychology. Mm-hmm. Um, As you and, <laughs> yeah. And um, uh, different, you know, uh, emotional and mental uh, instabilities that people yeah. deal with. And I'd read about a, a woman who um, was a case study. She was paranoid schizophrenic, but they said that she had transference okay. disorder, which meant that she transferred the illness onto the inanimate objects that she heard the voices from. She heard voices. Wow. And so, you know, I found the styrofoam head and I thought, well, I'm going to carry this to the ring, but I'm going, it's, as far as I'm concerned, the styrofoam head's crazy. I'm not. I'm completely healthy. And then that would create the constant um, struggle between me and the head that, you know, uh, where the head's trying to direct me. Yeah. And I'm fighting with the head because I don't feel the head's, you know, crazy. I think the head's crazy. I'm not, you know, and it's perfectly normal to uh, to talk to it. And, and, and my take on on, and you know, and I still believe this too, quite honestly, that a lot of people that we feel are quote unquote insane, maybe not necessarily are insane, just simply they have a different view of reality. Absolutely. And because they can see or view reality in a different manner doesn't necessarily mean that there's something wrong with them. Yeah. It just might mean that we can't see or experience, you know, what they do. Yeah. Um, and to use that logic, uh, a lot of times that I would, I would, and I didn't mean it in a uh, uh, heretical, heretical way. Um, but when people would ask me questions, you know, fans would come up and and they would ask me, you know, oh, you know, you, you know, I don't, you know, you can, you say you hear that, you know, the head talking to you, you know, that's not real. And I go, well, do you believe in God? They go, yeah. And I go, well, do you hear God talking to you? They go, yeah. And I go, well, I can't hear him talking to you. So how do I know yeah. that's real? Yeah. You know, and you would make people pause and think for a second and you could see them like, oh, wait, wait a minute. And it really made them question whether or not I was really insane yeah. or, you know, because I really believed that the head was speaking to me. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, in the, in the, the whole purpose of, na- of, you know, not giving, giving it a name was, was one. I did, I did not want to, um, create a, I wanted it to be asexual, mm-hmm. not, not have a gender of yes. any sort. And, and two, I wanted it to be uh, where it had multiple personalities and not have an identity unto itself. I want, you know, and my explanation was that it, they had multiple personalities. If you named one, you had to name them all because they would argue and yeah. fight and, you know, so you would just call it head as opposed to, you know, Jim, Bob, Tom, Sally, Karen, something of that nature. Um, And then when by interacting with them, you're just interacting with head, which is, you know, where there's all of the different personalities. Eventually I was wanting to have different heads that would manifest different sides of those personalities. Like I had the help me head, which was the original, but then I'd get, you know, the, I had one where, where the uh, brood had dropped blood on me, did a bloodbath. And I brought out a, what was called, you know, I had fear me on it. I wrote okay. fear me on my own forehead, fear me on, on the forehead of the head. And that was, you know, that writing 
was like a manifestation of my uh, inner feelings that I couldn't verbally voice, but that I could then demonstrate by putting them on either my head or, or the, the head's forehead. So, um, so there was a lot more depth to the character than oh, yeah. I think people realized. And, and I think so. it's fantastic because, you know, something that you picked up on there, you know, absolutely spot on was the whole fact that people are in it, basically in insane asylums, even over here, because, you know, they hear the voice of God or they hear, you know, different voices and they hear this, that and the other. And, you know, I, and I do completely agree with you that I think there needs to be a lot more study and a lot more um, understanding actually of what's going on here as opposed to just deeming this person, oh, they're just crazy. Uh, just because we don't understand it. And obviously, as we're delving deeper further into the mind and things, we're seeing stuff um, all the time now that, that that's coming out, which is, is fantastic. Um, and yeah, I think this show is going to obviously go ahead and, and um, bring a lot of things to light with the, the various guests that we've had on um, and just the different things that are happening. Um, you, you're running ECW isn't, you know, doesn't really last all that long for a variety of reasons, obviously, that you've covered in other uh, documentaries and, and other interviews. Um, uh, basically, you wind up back in the WWE with, you know, your, your persona of Al Snow and Head, this seemingly crazy guy, you know, but like you say, you completely invested in the character, you invested in everything that was there. What was it like now taking Al Snow and the head back to the WWE? Did they, did they get it and did they connect with it? Well, the audience connect mm -hmm. with it, um, certainly. Uh, I don't think that, you know, and this was my mistake is I didn't explain okay. or have conversations with Vince creatively to help him understand yeah. uh, all aspects of it. Oh, he's frozen again, folks. This is this is not the deep meditative face. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, and um, you know the uh, the catchphrase was everybody what does everybody love? But it was never been as a double entendre. It was yeah. you froze too. Um, the, what does everybody want? The tagline, the what does everybody want, need, love, all that. People got the double entendre yeah. but they didn't understand the real meaning of it which was i was doing that on purpose because i wanted to demonstrate that i was becoming jealous okay of of the head like it was a you know a separate ah. entity right and then at some point i would i would turn turn on it uh, because i really believed it was a real person and i was jealous because it wasn't after all these years of wanting success i still wasn't what everybody wanted needed or loved it was it was the head my partner wow and um and I should have explained that in depth to Vince because it could have taken the character in a whole different direction. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, and it would have been an entertaining way of, you know, entertaining TV and watching me, of course, you know, like what typically happens where, you know, a wrestler gets jealous of another wrestler and then they attack each other in the back yeah. and things like that. And I'd be, you know, uh, demanding that I would have to face it, you know, face head in a match and, things like, you know, to settle the score, things like that. Um, it would be, it would be, you know, interesting to do. Mm -hmm. And and I think for an audience, it would have been entertaining because they, quite honestly, people genuinely believed. I mean, if you had, if you'd asked nine out of 10 people back then, they would have told you I was completely medically, clinically insane. Yeah. yeah. You know, so, you know, um, and, 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 and you know, there were a lot of things that they had me do back then that were, at the time, seemed ridiculous. And, and But considering that I was the only guy, the only character on the roster that could get away with doing those yeah. things. Because for the audience to see Steve Austin or The Rock, you know, represent every European country when they come out wouldn't fit them. But for me, it, because I was a lunatic... You know, people just found it to be entertaining and, and enjoyed it. So, well, one of the questions, and it's 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 not the next one on the list, but because you brought it up, I'll touch on it now. Um, it, it's a phrase that seems to come up over and over and over again, and I wanted to ask you specifically about this. You know, a lot of people keep saying, you know, WWE dropped the ball on this, and they don't listen to uh, certain you know talent, and they don't listen to this, don't listen to that. The reason that I bring this up is because in your book you talk about um, you know wanting to dress and wanting to wrestle 
in the wide variety of different styles, you know, from, you know, the, uh, I've got it down on my list, you know, from the catch as catch can to the Japanese sumo. I mean, seeing you as a Japanese sumo in my mind, you know, it seems like something that, you know, would have made for really good TV and all the different um, styles, obviously, that you could do. Did you feel at that point when you were pitching these ideas that, you know, why aren't they listening? Why isn't this getting over? Is it the way that I'm explaining it? You know, have they got their own vision of what's going on here um, and it's just not, you know, grasping on it? What, what was kind of your mindset when you're coming up with all these different ideas and in some ways they're being shot down? Well, of course, I'm going to think that, you know, they're just they're not getting it or they don't mm -hmm. they don't want to do it or they don't like it like yeah. me or, you know, but really it comes down to you have to understand that when you're you're uh, creating uh a, a professional wrestling show yeah uh, it's a never-ending constantly evolving uh, living breathing um, thing and it's 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 like putting together a puzzle a mm -hmm. picture puzzle yeah um, and but you don't have a lid and you have no edge pieces okay and the wrestlers uh, and that, that, that puzzle changes because it's not a matter of, you know, okay, we're just going to make a picture of a horse standing in a field. Yeah. The puzzle evolves based on what the pieces did the week before. And and sure at that time for that reason. Did you get all that? We lost you a little bit there. <laughs> we, we got the, oh, the, the so. part about um, it, it's, you know, it's constantly evolving. It's constantly, you know, it's that puzzle that's constantly evolving and constantly changing. Right. So like, imagine the, the picture behind you with the elephants. Yeah. You're trying to, you're trying to make that picture, but that picture is constantly changing. And yeah. right now it's, it's, it's with them standing a far away in the in the grass well that might be where they now standing up close it, it, it constantly changes yeah. and develops each week based on what the guys the wrestlers go out there and do of course and uh, it's not a it's not a carved in stone like a lot of people think it's not like a you know scripted it's yeah. it's very much a you got to go with your instincts and you have to just you've got to pay attention and feel what the audience wants mm -hmm. what direction they're going and you know, and at the same time, you're trying to take them in the direction you want yeah. to go. But in order to be successful, you have to go in the in the path of least resistance, the path that the audience is already wanting to go. Of course, yeah. So it's it's you know, it's not as simplistic as mm -hmm. a lot of us think. Like I used to think as a wrestler myself, like well, they just you know they used to like me, or you know they're trying to you know keep me down. And when it's that wouldn't have been the case at all. And and that you know, and that's that's where it also comes into play. That when the wrestler goes through the curtain, then it's it's what that wrestler gives yeah. to the per, the people behind the scenes, the creative gives to them that they can use to then exploit and and produce. You know, it, the onus is one hundred percent on the wrestler. If yeah. they don't give the creative anything to use, then there's nothing the creative can do. Yeah. You know. Yeah. You just can't, can't, you know, you can't uh, draw blood from a turnip. So. And, and, and I think it's true that, and, and that's a great phrase, but, you know, Roddy Piper, I think, said it best, you know, when he went out into the ring, he decided, you know, what was going to happen and how he was going to get over in that moment and in that instance. And like you said, right at the beginning of the show, and what you've said before, you know, taking ownership of yourself um, and not expecting other people to do it for you. Uh, which, you know, again, I think is a fantastic thing. And, you know, you can always say, well, that would have been a good idea and that would have been a good idea. You know, we, we, in business, we make, you know, sometimes, especially in the wrestling business, they make it, as you said, you know, based on what happened the night before, based on, you know, what's going on and trends that are happening. Um, it's not like you say, you know, we're planning for five years, you know, um, away from now because it's ever, it's ever changing. And it is. It's always developing. It's always, you know, and the audience is always changing and evolving too. And you, yeah. you know, like I said, it's a living, breathing thing. So you've, you've got to be able. It's a very. It's not a. It's not like any other art form. You have yeah. to really, you know, um, 
be in, immersed in it and and be you know and like when I write TV now, I'm I'm not writing TV the night that I sit down and have a meeting. I'm in my head, you know, from the moment that I get done, like last night producing television, I'm going back through and rewatching what happened and what stood out to me and why it stood out to me, and then I'm I'm you know starting to piece those things together for the following week and, and not just for the following week, but a direct. It's going to take me six months from now work yeah. to, to get a wrestler that. We're going to freeze again. Um, there we go. You know, hasn't been utilized that base so that when I do you get all that. Yep. Yep. We just about got that. <laughs> uh, yeah. So it's, it's, uh, you know, that's part of the magic and the fun um, behind the scenes of doing the creative, but it's also a big challenge too, because yeah. you've got to, you've got to always be on it. And, you, you know, you've got to deal with the personalities um, that of the wrestlers who, of course, are demanding and wanting that attention and those that those opportunities, but you know, and, and of course, they're not going to understand that it's based on what they give you as yeah. to what you can do. So, yeah, you know, it's, it's 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 interesting. Yes, it it is. It's you know, and when you explain it like that again, it it brings the curtain back a little bit more to understand the process that goes on behind it. Um, and, and so many, you know, different areas, like you're saying, so many different elements to the jigsaw puzzle that is the, the world of professional wrestling. Al, I wanted to ask you as well, um, and the reason that, you know, because you were there, uh, we did a show with Georgia Smith a couple of weeks ago, uh, the daughter of the British Bulldog, and um, we, we got talking about Owen Hart and, and all the other things, that, and obviously Owen, you know, has, uh, you know, been very, very well documented about his passing, and, you know, the, the, I think it's the twenty. 20th or 21st anniversary at this point where we are um you know and, and it's been talked about a lot about how you know owen's passing and there's documentaries out there folks for those of you who want to, to to go and see uh and, and to know more about it but one thing i wanted to ask you just briefly al you know because whenever you're in a business long enough there's always going to be those times of loss there's always going to be times of, of difficulty and struggle what was it like not necessarily the night of owen's passing but going forward perhaps the week or two afterwards where was everybody's you know w w obviously because the night of it would have been you know shock and oh my goodness i can't believe this has happened what was it like once it started to set in well once it's set in you know you you have the you know you go through the grieving process uh -huh. and you know no different than anybody else okay. but you know um the one thing i think i've learned from that from wrestling and from just you know, from experience in life is that, you know, life is relentless. Yeah. It doesn't stop. It doesn't quit. It doesn't, it doesn't slow down. You know, yeah. you've just got to keep moving forward. And as much as we've been in situations like that, we'd like to, we'd like the world to halt, stop yeah. spinning and uh, come to a close. It doesn't. Yeah. And you've got to, you, you know, you've got to, um, the number one rule in wrestling is to take shit and make shoe polish. <laughs> yes. And, um, and that applies to life, and, you know, and so you learn, I've learned because I've been so blessed to have met so many amazing people. And, and as I've gotten older and losing them at an incredible rate, um, it's more about celebrating what you had than it is mourning what you've lost. Because, you know, if you, if you focus only on what you've lost, then you never really get to remember how much you really had with that person. And, you know, and how blessed and lucky you were to have that person in your life and experience that. So it doesn't change the, the grieving process, but it certainly uh, helps it. That's for sure. I, I think that's a really fantastic, you know, um, thing that you said there, because we were covering this in another show uh, where we're talking about suicide and suicide prevention. Um, and, you know, it, it's 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 true that, unfortunately, as much as we want to get off life's roller coaster, sometimes we're on it. You know, you can't get off it until the ride is done. And, uh, you know, I, I think that was a really helpful thing that the way that you um, articulately put that. Um, 
I wanted to obviously moving on because, you know, your, your wrestling career continued massively through, you know, 98 and, and 90 and 99 when you are, you know, I, I would say at, at the most, you know, active at that point where we're seeing you all the time. Certainly I was and I was probably more exposed to you then. But one of the things that really caught my attention, and I suppose in some ways, it's, it's weird that I'm saying this, but formed a bond with you was when you started teaching in Tough Enough. Um, is there anything that you want to talk about wrestling wise before we move on into, into the, the tough enough era, shall we say? Uh, no, I, you know, tough enough is probably one of the things that I'll be the most proud of being a part of. And, it was phenomenal. Uh, it, it really was yeah. because, you know, you, you had gone from, you know, being this wrestler that, you know, again, you could connect with, you had in, incredible hardcore matches. And I will always remember the psychology of, of the matches and, and, you know, so many of the things from the Mississippi River. And, and folks, if you want to check out Al's, you know, stories, you, you've got to read his book, um, Bizarre Wrestling, or, or Self-Help, The Life Lessons of the Bizarre Wrestling Career of Al Snow. It's on Amazon. We'll put up the, uh, the links underneath so you can check it out. But, you know, you had so many, you know, encounters, obviously, like we, we say with the Mississippi River, with Bob Holly wrestling against Head. You finally got that match against Head, um, which is quite a, a, a sight to behold, for sure. Um, and then on, on obviously into so many different things. But for me, and I'm just speaking my personal opinion, I really connected with you probably the most as a teacher because you're a very, very different kind of teacher. Um, and, you know, again, we're tough enough. That's, you know, that that. I think for me is what I will always, you know, have that connection with. Talk to us a little bit about how this comes about. Was it something the WWE presented to you? How does this happen? I, I was approached by Kevin Dunn, mm -hmm. uh, the president of television. They had this new project that they wanted to do. And they, he explained it to me and that his, who became a lifelong friend of mine, um, big mm -hmm. uh, John Gaborik, was going to be the WWE's producer of it. MTV was producing the show, and it was kind of a cross between the real world and Survivor, where okay. um, for the very first time, you know, they would bring uh, people together to live together, but they were co actually competing for a prize, which was a contract with WWE. Um, and, and, you know, I asked if I'd be interested and would be a part of it. And, you know, I basically, you know, agreed. Mm -hmm. um, was always open to doing things. And, um, you know, we uh, uh, did the show and, you know, at the time it was groundbreaking because it, it, it had been, the concept had never been done before. Yeah. And, and this was back in the day when it was, they were truly reality TV shows. Like they, I explained this to people that it wasn't scripted. Yeah. Um, they didn't tell you what to do. They didn't produce it. They just turned the cameras on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And then, you know, what they got footage wise, they had, you know, they would create yeah. stories out of and, you know, make a TV show. And, um, you know, it was, it was an awesome experience and, um, I'm always grateful that I had it and, you know, um, you know, and, and it was an incredible opportunity and I can't, can't say thank you enough to everybody that was involved to, to have had that experience and been a part of it. Was was the conflict for you going into that transition of no longer being as much an active wrestler and going into more of a teaching role, or was it something like you say that you just welcomed and said, "This this could be a good you know good thing to do"? I it, it was just you know at the time it was just an opportunity that was presented, and I yeah. thought you know let's let's do it. I didn't you know nobody it had never been done before, so. You know, there's no way that you can tell, you can say, well, I don't know if, you know, weigh the differences yeah. between being an active wrestler and being on this is what do you, you know, which is going to be better. You, you couldn't tell. I mean, there's no way you could have any idea, and, you know, but, you know, it sounded interesting and exciting and, and, um, you know, and I was, I was more than willing to do it. And, um, and we, and like I said, it was, it was an awesome, awesome experience. That's really great. And, and, you know, and, and like I say, I mean, it was, I think for so many that saw it, it was, it was a very, very different side as well. And a lot of life lessons came from that. But one of the things, you know, obviously with this being the mind, body and soul podcast, we're able to talk about a little bit more is, you know, obviously you doing what you do have seen people at the best and you've seen people at their worst. And, you know, you had talked about in the book that, there were some scary situations from a, from a mental um, wellness standpoint. 
with some of the kids than the competitors that were on the show. Talk to us a little bit about some of the things that you'd experienced with them. It's just the, I think the stress and um, pressure yeah. of, um, you know, and, and also the constant never ending uh, being under a microscope, um, you know, realizing that, you know, every second of the day you're being filmed, yeah. um, you know, and even the, everybody's worried of how they appear and, you know, how they oh, come yeah. across and, uh, you know, image wise and, you know, we're all very self-conscious and, you know, well, imagine that now you're, you're having to worry, you know, from every little second going yeah. to the bathroom and, you know, did you make too much noise and did they have a camera with the, you know, and their microphone outside wow. of it, that's going to be embarrassing or, you know, and that, that has, and then you're taking kids anywhere from probably 18 years old, you know, 18 yeah. and up um, and how, you know, this is the first time for some of them to be away from home, to be out of the mom and dad environment, you know, and here they are on television, you know, competing to, you know, live a dream mm -hmm. and, uh, and then coming to grips with the reality of compared to the fantasy of living that dream. Yeah. Uh, because let's say, you know, we all romanticize our, our, our idea of what we want to do or be, but then, you know, that what separates, separates us all is, are you willing to do the things that others don't do to live a life that others won't live? You know, that's, that's, that's all it comes down to. Yeah. And, and, and you have to be, I tell people all the time, you know, we all, and, 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 and quite honestly, we all lie mm -hmm. to people every day, you know, you, to some degree, we alter the truth. Um, but the one person you should never lie to is to yourself. And you, you know, and when it comes to, especially in pursuit of your goals and your dreams, be honest with yourself and say, I am willing to do what it takes mm -hmm. to do this. Or guess what? I'm not. And as a result, I'm going to get, you know, what I've put in. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, you know, so you, you know, realize like the, the people like, you know, you see Lady Gaga on the, uh, you know, on the uh, award shows and she's wearing a meat dress, you know, she's not wearing that meat dress because she likes wearing a meat dress. You know, she's doing it to get people to talk about her, because, yeah. you know, and it, it serves a purpose, but it's because that's her life. You know, her life is to do things that you won't do yeah. and live that life that you won't live. And, and you know, um, and to be subjected to criticism and, you know, because if you're the center of attention, um, that means you're literally the, in the center and, yeah. and not all of it's going to be positive and not all of it's going to be right directly in front of you or in your face. It's a lot of, it's going to be half of it. If not more of it, it's going to be behind your back. Um, so you, you have to have a thick skin and be willing to, to deal with that. Um, and, and that, and whether it's a public pursuit or it's just, it's a, a, whatever the passion is that you want, if you know, you're going to deal with, with that kind of, uh, stuff and if you can't deal with it to make realize that and say well this is not for me and and you know i think there's no shame actually in having that conversation because some of the time you do have to have that honesty with yourself where you stand and you have that conversation with yourself where you stand there and say you know is this something i really want to do there's no harm there's no you know shame in, in getting your feet wet and seeing what it's like but then when you come out the other side you got to say do i want to do, you know dedicate the next 20 years of my life to this and it's important to do right. so yeah, there's nothing wrong with trying. And, yeah. uh, and in fact, you know, that separates you from the, from the hurt because there are so many that would claim that they want to do something, but never even get up off, get up and get on their feet and actually yeah. attempt to do it. So, so the, the, the one that I, um, that I remember specifically from the book, um, because I remember the show was Hawk, um, you know, and, and again, I, I think it was tough enough too, if I've got that correct. Um, and Hawk, you describe as basically sitting there on a sun lounger and having a full blown, Al Snow conversation with no heads and no nothing that was there. What was going through your mind at that point? Was it, you know, what was it? What just was that? worried. Yeah. Just worried for him. I mean, obviously, I mean that, you know, um, I'm concerned um, and, you know, a little, you know, frightened for him, mm -hmm. you know, to, to watch him, watch him do that, you know, to watch a person go from just the average person and, you know, behaving in a certain way to all yeah. of a sudden watching them, do that it's it's it is very uh you know it's very uh you know uh causes a lot of creates a lot of concern and for his safety and for his well-being of course absolutely um do you know how he's doing these days 
just as, as I, you know, I, I spoke, I've spoken to him numerous times over the years, but I, I haven't spoken to him in the recent okay. past, you know, so the, he was doing well. He was in LA, you know, after the show and was trying to still pursue things uh, television wise. Um, I know at one point he was kind of being considered as Colossus for one of the okay. earliest X-Men films oh, wow. back then. Um, but uh, that didn't pan out. And, uh, and then he, you know, I'd seen him on a couple different uh, television shows, game shows, things like that. Um, but other than that, I've, I've kind of lost contact yeah. with him since then. And, and it's, you know, again, this, this is, you know, I suppose in, in what we're trying to get across here, folks, is the lengths and, and like Al was saying, the thick skin that people have to have in order to do what they do. Because when you are in that entertainment world, when you're in the, it doesn't matter whether you're in the entertainment world or whatever line of work that you're in and you are one of the top guys, girls, etc you know, you are going to have stress from every single angle. And obviously the mind works in very, very different ways. And some people, it affects us all in different ways. That's for sure. Some people do have breakdowns and recover. Some people, you know, seem to be all right with it. And then obviously years later, the, you know, that's when they have the breakdown. I think when the pressure's, you know, been lifted. Al, I want to ask you as well, because just to explain in, in, in I suppose, briefly that, what happened with Tough Enough at the end? Because I think you were there for what three or four seasons, and all of a sudden it was taken over by Steve Austin. What happened was it was it all really of a sudden that's been there was a big years of you know uh, distance and time between the okay. two events. Um, you know, it was just that at the time MTV uh, wanted to own all of the properties, television right. properties that they had on their uh, network, and the you know. Tough Enough was owned by WWE hmm. and they, uh, you know, no longer wanted to produce it. Not because it was, you know, it did great in the ratings, but because they, they didn't have ownership of it. Right. And, um, and then there was a large contingent in the a camp in the office that WWE that thought that it was, you know, not good for wrestling. Okay. And then there was a just as equally large contingent that thought that it was great. Um, but it came down to Kevin Dunn, the president of WWE TV, who decided that he no longer wanted to pursue it as a project. And, um, you know, uh, that Spike TV had contacted uh, WWE at the time and wanted to do Tough Enough, wanted to produce Tough Enough, you know much like MTV and, um, but they passed and, uh, which opened the door for USC and, uh, Dana White and Pat, you know, gave him the opportunity for ultimate fighter, which mm -hmm. he basically said was a complete ripoff of tough enough, which led to a, you know, the boom of popularity for UFC because the, yeah. you know, ultimate fighter allowed the, uh, UFC audience to get to know who the fighters were. And actually, as far as personality, character, and, and care as to who won, who lost. So that was the aspect that was missing with UFC and, okay. and opened the door for that. I was going to ask just before we move on from Tough Enough, just while it's in my mind, uh, we go back to that whole thing of people needing to listen to advice. And um, I, I think one of your favorite comments or whatever it is, when uh, Tough Enough 3, I believe, was on and you had, how can I phrase this? Legitimate stuff that was going on, which should have been more in a, in a controlled environment. Obviously, some of the kids that were there and drove the big show crazy. Uh, others, you know, nearly, you know, ended Kurt Angle. Um, at that point, are you starting to get frustrated and saying if they'd only listen and actually trust me in, in what I'm saying here, you know, because now people are starting to get injured and people are getting hurt. Where was your head at at that point when you're seeing this? Was it something you just stood back and said, well, I told you so? Or, or... Pretty much. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. That's about all you can do is just, you know, uh, look, you know, you can, again, you, it comes down to you can only control you. Yeah. You can't control other people, you know, and you, you, you know, you're only in charge of yourself. So, um, you know, I can give advice, but if you're smart enough, I don't need to tell you. If you're dumb enough, you're not going to listen. Yeah. Too many people give advice and then, you know, they take it personally when, you know, the person doesn't make the decisions they feel should be made. Okay. And you, you have to realize and distance yourself and understand that, you know, number first and foremost, you don't wake up with it and you don't go to bed with it. Yeah. 
you're not the one who's going to pay the price because for every choice or decision, there's a cost. And if you're not the one who's going to pay the price, why are you getting upset? And that's good. You can do it out of concern and you can be sympathetic and you can be empathetic, but again, you can't control other people. Yeah. So, you know, they have to make their own choices. They have to make their own decisions and you can advise all you want. But again, if they're smart enough, you don't need to tell them. If they're dumb enough, they ain't going to listen. I think that's a great way of putting it. It, it really is, you know, like you say, you, you can give the advice, but it's up to them whether they take it or not. And, you know, that's a fantastic thing. It really is. Obviously, you know, your career, you know, takes a, a very, very different turn. And one of the things I want to talk to you uh, about just from a, a physical point of view, because obviously your body went through some very dramatic changes um, physically with, you know, the look that you had in the mid 90s to where you're at now. What happened? <laughs> uh, the only thing that really happened was that I, um, because I had started training to be a professional wrestler when I was 16, 15 or 16 years old. And okay. I didn't have any guidance and I didn't have anybody really teach me. I was all pretty much self-taught. And, um, you know, I was, I trained very, I always trained very hard. And, yeah. Um, but sometimes I didn't train in the right way. And the, the biggest thing that really changed everything changed the development was just training in the correct way and, and that was you know um i'd seen uh, some pictures of old-time wrestlers and strong men on the uh internet that were from like the late 1800s yeah early 1900s uh, if anybody wants to google george hackenschmidt oh yes yeah yeah um you know they looked incredible so mm -hmm. i thought you know this was at a period of time where they didn't they didn't know anything about nutrition mm -hmm. they didn't know calories or carbs or protein or anything like that they certainly didn't have the what people assume is the magic bullet steroids yeah um or anything of that nature and um you know i thought well if they look that good for doing that i'm going to do what they did mm -hmm. and what they did was that they trained in a more functional manner um and they really focused on doing compound type lifts and um and really utilizing as much of the musculature as possible on performing some of those lifts. And, and the, the, one of the like uh, training manuals from back in the day, one of the uh, old time strongmen said, you know, if you can only work out three times a week, you know, focus on your legs, your back and your hands. Yeah. And um, uh, you know, which is completely the opposite of what you're told to do today. Yep. And, um, you know, that was what I started doing and uh, started using different equipment like the kettlebells. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, developed into using uh, it's a Indian Gata, which is a mace. Um, so I do a lot of rotational training and okay. ballistic training, uh, the Indian clubs. Uh, at some point, I want to get some Persian meals, um, which people can look up all of this online and see what they are. Um, uh, and, a, and a lot of more body weight uh, training as well, mm -hmm. but really just fundamental exercises and more really uh, utilizing, the, the biggest thing was utilizing my legs. And, uh -huh. uh, you know, that was what really transformed everything was the more that I worked on my legs, did squats, mm -hmm. uh, you know, deadlifts, things of that nature, very functional uh, compound movements. Um, the more I did that, and, uh, and not and stopped adopting the hey I'm just going to work one party body part a day but yeah work work the entire body every time I do it I might work out three or four or five days and then I'll take two days off yeah. or I might work out three days and you know take four days off or I might you know but that was the other thing too was constantly changing and and not just doing a set uh, particular workout program for you know. Um, which was for shock my body constantly yeah. and forcing it to adapt. And, <coughs> and, and it certainly did. Excuse me. Yeah, it's uh, okay. I was just going to say, because that's one of the things that I... And it made a really big difference. I, absolutely, because that was one of the things that I was taught when I was, you know, when I started out in bodybuilding was if you want a big upper body, you've got to get, you know, the big, the big lower body and you've got to work your legs. And every time I was in the gym, 
you know, because we used to do the whole thing of, you know, one day you'll work arms and back, next day you'll work chest and, and do this. Nowadays, because of my schedule and things, you know, I'm, and I'm, I'm currently just re recovering actually from a, a mild injury, but um, normally what I will do is full body, you know, workout. And sometimes I try and get in two, three times a week, but I notice the big difference that if you're only going to get in once or twice a week, you know, and you exercise the entire body, well, that body's going to thank you for it, as opposed to, well, you know, you've exercised arms, well, that's great, but what about the rest of your body? And it's having, it, it's, it comes back to education and that mindset of, I need to find out the real information as opposed to, well, today I'm just going to work arms and today I'm just going to do this, do that. You know, your body will thank you for uh, all, you know, for, for basically giving it a good workout. We talk about, and I just want to pick on this with you as well from a, I suppose, a personal point of view, nutritional side of things, because people have talked to me for years and years and years about protein powders and all this kind of stuff. When I got colitis when I was 15 years old, that was one of the things that I had to stop because it was actually uh, seriously damaging for me. But people that don't actually realize that you only absorb a small amount of protein into your body. So people that are giving you all this garbage and saying, well, you know, you need this protein powder, you need that protein powder, the more more you take of it that the bigger you're going to become it's it's marketing folks it's nonsense sure. Al, what what would you say re regarding nutrition um for, for me it comes back to you know fresh foods not this you know obviously the united states is very very different over, than, than over here for what we have additives and things um as i was talking with eric bischoff about that off air that was a whole other conversation that was quite entertaining um but it is for, for us, you know, it's, it's making sure that whatever we eat is fresh, it's not pre-packaged, it doesn't have all these additives in. How is it for you guys over there and what kind of things would you recommend? I just exactly the same thing. Okay. You want to try to eat as clean as possible and just eat, you know, real uh, natural foods. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, that's, it's hard. I mean, like I just had to stop at McDonald's and get, you know, 20 chicken nuggets. But, oh, you know, I hear you. <laughs> But it's you have balance. to feed your, but yeah, you, and you know, you're going to have those days, but you know, you're going to have to feed your body. Um, you know, that's the key is that people don't realize they think, you know, the, the key to losing weight is a lot of times not eating, but that yeah. puts your body in a state that it has to, you know, starvation. So it's storing yeah. as much as it gets so that, you know, because it's trying to you know, in order to, to lose weight, the body feel like it's not going to starve so that it can then utilize and burn what it gets for energy. Absolutely. And there's a lot of books out there now about, you know, eating that balanced diet. And it is more about a lifestyle choice rather than, you know, the Atkins diet or this diet or that diet. It is about, you know, uh, making those life changes and those decisions. Are you a big fan of protein powders? Uh, they have their uses and they're they're good uh, supplement yeah. eating supplementation too, but not a be all end all. No, by no means. That's that's and and you know I mean I'm glad to hear you say that because you know I've, we've had guests on the past that that's just what they swear by is protein 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 and then they get the big shock when it's like oh your body only absorbs a tiny fraction. We used to call it in the gym expensive pee and word stronger than that because that's basically what it is. You can spend a fortune obviously on that. Al, you know, as, as you're transitioning now into, you know, another phase in your life and a lot of things that's going on, I, I wanted to ask you, what long-term effects has wrestling had on you? I know from your book, you've had, you know, several strokes, uh, minor, I believe. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, they've, you know, they've created their own issues, yeah. um, you know, but, uh, but, you know, I'm, you know, I've been very lucky and blessed that that you know, it's not worse. Um, good. You know, body-wise, physically, I mean, your your wrestling is going to take a toll. Of course, um, it's a lot of physical abuse. Um, I just recently had bilateral knee replacement surgery, um, and uh, coping with that. But um, you know, it's it's just it's part of it. It's what, yeah. You know, I I can't complain. I mean, I you know I say it all the time. I can't you know I complain about hurting and being in pain, but then I turn around and go, well, I did it to myself. So. <laughs> yes made the choice so you know you and you you correct it you fix it um you do everything you can to stay healthy and you know uh, and move on and can't keep moving so 
And it is, I mean, it's, it is a fantastic thing, obviously, that you're, you, you, you're going and you're doing as well as you're doing, obviously, just having, you know, the, the surgeries and things. As we wrap up the show, just a, a few final questions, you know, and, and just, I suppose, the, the simple ones, you know, who influenced you as a child and who influences you now? Well, my parents, of course, uh, were a huge, were the biggest influence, you know, um, and, and that really, that's, that quite honestly, when I'm growing up and uh, it influences me now, I, you know, uh, just the world around me. I mean, I try to uh, try to be the, as, as the best person I could possibly be within the circumstances that I've dealt with, so. That's an incredible answer. I like that answer. Uh, it's good. Is there a spiritual side to Al Snow? Uh, certainly, yes. Um, I don't believe in religion, um, and but I don't condemn or, or yeah. uh, fault anyone for it. And, you know, it's each individual to their own. Um, it's you know that's fine, but I do believe that there is you know something more, um, certainly a higher power. Um, otherwise, we're just nothing more than just for it. this is all just random chaos we're just higher evolved animals that are you know thinking that we're better than what we really are final couple of questions al you know what is something or, or what are you passionate about today i'm passionate about my family and my wife and uh and about uh pursuing and building the business of ovw and um you know, and uh, passing along to the, the young men and women um, the skills to pursue their dreams and try to make them as successful as possible. It's really awesome. Is there anything that you want to cover that we haven't covered in our, in our double episode? I, no, I, you know, I hope everybody, uh, it, you know, now because OVW is available worldwide mm -hmm. um, through Roku and uh, Amazon Fire and Amazon Prime in the UK, we're on uh, Sports, uh, Sports uh, International. Yep. Um, and uh, you, um, you can watch us there. Um, you know, uh, I hope people uh, will tune in, watch the show, watch the development of these young men and women and um, support them. And uh, if anybody wants, uh, they can go to ovwrestling.com or aswa.live. They can get more information. Uh, we're going to have our first online pay-per-view December 5th wow. at 7.30 p.m. Eastern time. And they can watch, they can buy uh, uh, and view the, a virtual ticket um, on at obwrestling.com. They can uh, watch the, the pay-per-view December 5th. You can watch it in the UK or anywhere else in the world. So, you know, uh, please join us. Absolutely. It is really incredible from the stuff that I've seen, the trailers that I've already seen on Instagram uh, and elsewhere. It, you guys really are doing a fantastic job. And it's, it's encouraging to start to see... You know, I, I, would territories be the wrong word? But to start to see them coming back a little bit now, uh, which is quite nice. And I think it's healthy as well, which is uh, very, very encouraging. Al, if folks want to reach you, where can they find you on social media? Uh, they can find me at The Real Al Snow on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, there were some imposters. And <laughs> yes. if, you choose, if you choose to be an imposter, I'm just going to message you and ask you why you didn't raise the bar and try to you're going to fake being a celebrity. Why not be George Clooney or Brad Pitt or somebody? You know, Neil Armstrong, for God's sakes. He was the first man on the moon. Why do you want to be Al Snow? So, because uh, you're one of the greatest teachers of our generation. And, and that's, you know, I think yeah. a, a good, and, and I love the way that you see the world as well. I think it's really fascinating. And it's been a pleasure to do this show uh, and to do both shows, in fact, with you. Um, and uh, it's, I look forward to seeing, you know, all the other things that's coming on. And we'd love to have you back on the show, of course, uh, because there's so much more to, to Al Snow. And folks, like I say, you've got to check out, you know, Al Snow's book, Self-Help, Life Lessons from the Bizarre Wrestling Career of Al Snow. You will find some stories in there that are hilarious. You'll find some stories in there that will leave you like, oh, my goodness, I can't believe this is actually true. But you'll get a deeper glimpse into the amazing person of Al Snow as well. And when we're talking about books, it would be uh, remiss of me if I didn't mention my own, which is called The Battles We All Face. Al, there's a book coming towards you, in fact, as we speak right now. It's out really? in the post. Um, and it includes, you know, life lessons, you know, whether you're dealing with anxiety or trauma or struggle, depression, you know, or even just managing your time and so much more. These are life lessons that I've learned over the last decade and really have saved me in, in more, more than one occasion. 
and it's a delight to put it together. It's actually the book that's behind me and you can check it out at thebattleswheelfeast.com uh, and we will absolutely love to, uh, to get this book into as many hands as possible. And uh, Al, I wanna thank you so much for being my special guest. It has been an honor and a privilege to, uh, to do this show with you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, John. I really appreciate it. I enjoyed it. And folks, as we wrap up, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe because it helps our little business grow. Go and visit Al, of course. Tell a friend about this show because it could be the very thing that they need to inspire them, to motivate them, to educate them. And folks, we just want to say a massive thank you for you for watching. And until next time, take care. God bless. And I'll see you soon. Do you struggle with motivation? Feel yourself procrastinating a lot? Have amazing ideas and dreams, but struggle with the concepts of how to get from where you are to where you want to be? Or maybe looking for something a little bit simpler, like wanting to get fit, or maybe wanting to lose a few pounds and tighten things up? Are you someone that struggles with anxiety or trauma or even depression? You're not alone. Many people around the world do. Hi folks, I'm John Morris. And for the last two decades, I've been working with people from all over the world in all walks of life to really understand human beings, the concept, the behaviors, and ultimately the reasons why. And I've had the privilege of coaching and working with folks just like you, that maybe are struggling with anxiety or depression or trauma or wanting to get ahead, wanting to maybe build some long-term success, but have no idea how to begin. This is what I do. And with John Morris Life Coaching, you're in really, really good hands. Why can I say this? Because you're not only gonna get an experienced life coach, you're also gonna get somebody that has a wide variety of experiences from youth ministry and working with teenagers and children to someone who's worked with drug addicts and alcoholics, people that have day-to-day -day dependency issues, to, to somebody maybe just like you that just wants that little bit of encouragement, wants that little bit of motivation and wants support to get to that next level. With John Morris Personal Life Coaching, you're in really good hands. A lot of my clients would tell you if they were here now that one of the greatest assets to John Morris Life Coaching is you can see things exactly as you want to see them without fear of being controlled and conformed like a lot of therapists and coaches do. We help you right where you're at to get to the place that you want to be, step by step, to figure out a plan. So if this sounds like something that you would be interested in, having that support, motivation, encouragement, and even education, should you need it, then get in touch with me today. I would love to hear from you. Places are limited, so please don't delay. We've got a very, very small window of opportunity remaining. We all need help from time to time, but the difference between success and failure, achieving our dreams and maybe just letting our dreams go by, depends on the level of help that we have available and that we're willing to accept. So get in touch with me today at John Morris Life Coaching. You'll be glad you did, and I'll see you soon.